Good evening. I am Amy Barbie, and I'm the executive director of the LBJ Foundation, and I have the pleasure to welcome you to this screening of the sun. You are in for a treat and also a bit of a jolt. Warning, there is violent content, as I believe you have all been advised. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the Moody Foundation, the St. David's Healthcare, Frost Bank, University Federal Credit Union. Thank you for making our friends' programs possible. And tonight we have a rare opportunity to experience a preview and discussion of AMC's 10-part series, The Sun, based on Philip Meyer's epic novel about a Texas family. The AMC series debuts on April 8th, but we get a sneak peek tonight. And it's very appropriate for the screening of The Sun to take place at the LBJ Library. Since the book covers 150 years of Texas history, from Johnson's Hill Country to the coastal plains, it can't help but intersect with LBJ's Texas. The book includes a scene from LBJ's Senate campaign stop, arriving on the ranch in a cloud of dust via helicopter. Character Janine McCullough muses, the man she saw in front of her was so happy in the crowd, so happy to be watched and paid attention to, there could not be room, room inside him for anything else. That certainly describes LBJ. <laughs> and the man who made this all possible, Philip Meyer. Philip Meyer did not take the traditional route. Dropping out of high school in Baltimore at the age of 16 and getting his GED while working as a bicycle mechanic. At the age of 20, he, did, he decided to become a writer and after his third attempt, was admitted to Cornell University. That is not an easy feat. After graduating, he worked on Wall Street, then decided to get his MFA from the Mishner Center for Writing here at the University of Texas. Meyer, who lives in Austin, spent five years researching his novel, conducted hundreds of interviews, and immersed himself into the characters who lived in Texas in the mid-19th through the early 20th centuries. The Sun was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Literature and won the Western Heritage Book Award and the Writers League of Texas Book Award. In a few minutes, we will watch the first segment of the AMC series, which is 45 minutes screening, which will be followed by a discussion with Mark Updegrove, Pierce Brosnan, Philip Meyer, and Kevin Murphy. But first, to give us historical perspective on the son's sweeping family saga spanning 150 years and three generations of the McCullough family, please welcome the author of The Son and co-creator and executive producer of the AMC series, Philip Meyer. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming, guys, and thanks for that very sweet introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get to talking about this episode we're about to see, but first, th there are a few people um, I'd like to talk about and thank, but th th the people who are the reason we're all here tonight. Uh, Jim Magnuson, the director of the Mitchell Center. Uh, you know, Jim is the reason I came to Texas. He's the reason I fell in love with the state. He's the reason I made my home here. And uh, of course, Marla Aiken did her part as well in that. Uh, Don Graham, whose Texas history class taught me the foundational stuff that ended up both in the novel and, and in the show. Michael Adams, who advised me at the Mitchell Center and got me this fellowship to live at J. Frank Doby's old ranch, where I wrote a lot of this book. And uh, when I wasn't writing, I was uh, engaging in the most typical of Texas hobbies, which, as we all know, is clearing brush. Um, so I, I brought my own chainsaw to the ranch, as, as one does. And um, every afternoon when I was done writing, I would go and knock down cedar. Uh, and I probably ended up clearing three or four acres and got the place looking a bit lo more like it had been when, uh, when Doby lived there. And there came a point where I realized, okay, for the past six months, you've spent about half your waking hours clearing brush. So now maybe you're a real Texan. <laughs> and the other half of the reason we're here tonight is AMC. Um, I'd like to thank those folks for believing in, in this project and, and, for, and frankly for taking what was a pretty huge risk uh, on me. And this might seem counterintuitive looking in from the outside, 
but it's, it's quite rare for folks in Hollywood to allow an author to adapt his own book. There, there are a lot of good reasons for this, um, kind of these issues of can, can the guy who wrote the book get enough distance from the original kind of source material to reimagine it for the screen? Does he understand that TV and film have a completely different set of strengths and limitations you know, com compared to a book? And is this person going to be capable of adapting to a completely different way of, of working? You know, um, as, a, as an author, you're alone in your room all day by yourself. You don't talk to anyone. And when you're making a TV show, you were with other people all day long, uh, collaborating with them. And in fact, once those people sign on to your project, um, it's not just that you have to collaborate with them because to, to be nice, but th their jobs are actually on the line if things go bad. So sort of unlike being an author, which if I mess up, okay, the only one who suffers is me. When you're working on a show, you're sort of, you're sort of buoying the careers of all the people who are, who are along uh, you know, on the project with you. So because of that, there's a very difficult balance in Hollywood between uh, making sure that the, the people's voices uh, get heard and making sure the project stays good. Um, nothing good gets done by committee in Hollywood or anywhere else. There has to be a kind of singular voice and a vision. But there's a very real and very logical pressure out there of we know the way this works. We've done it this way for 30 years. Um, we know if we do it this way, we'll keep our jobs. You know, admire you're not going to get us fired kind of thing. Um, and that is always in conflict with the fact that all good art, by definition, is new. It's always different from the things that have come before it. And, and that difference and that newness is what actually makes it good. There, there's a fundamental difference between you know, a Rembrandt and a copy of a Rembrandt. And there's a fundamental difference between a novel by William Faulkner and a novel by a guy who's imitating William Faulkner. And so a lot of people wanted this project. Um, there are a lot of big offers, and people wanted to buy the rights uh, to the book from me, but no one wanted me attached. No one wanted me involved. They, they saw me as a pure liability, which actually was probably intelligent. Um, and the only exception to this were AMC and a studio called, called Sonar, who collaborated with AMC to, to make the show. And they said, all right, Meyer, We'll try it. You, you and your buddies, who are my, my uh, Mishra Center uh, like fellow students, you can be the creators. You can do most of the writing, executive produce, the whole shebang. This will be your show. And this was a, a massive risk for them to take. Uh, I knew how to tell a story, and writing scripts is a bit easier than writing novels. But I was completely ignorant of how the business worked, completely ignorant of how a set worked. You know, I don't think I would even met an actor by, by then. Um, but the network was very patient with me. And uh, we spent three years developing the show with them, working kind of pretty closely on a daily or weekly basis. We all knew we wanted to tell a big story. We knew we wanted to tell a story in a way that really hadn't been done before. And uh, at the end of that three years, AMC finally said, okay, we're gonna give you a writer's room. We're gonna hire a showrunner, other there was a person who actually knows what they're doing. Uh, and um, four or five months after that, they gave us a green light to make the show, and then we were casting, finding locations, building sets, and then finally actually shooting. Um, so I'm extremely humbled and grateful uh, to those folks because they, they, you know, it seems like the smart thing to do, oh, could you hire the original guy, but it actually is a huge risk. And um, so a lot of these people had to head back to New York to beat this big snowstorm that's coming in, this snowpocalypse. Um, but I'll mention their names anyway. Uh, Joel Stillerman, Charlie Collier, Stephen Reinhardt in New York, Susie Fitzgerald, Carrie Gologli, Emma Miller in LA, of course, Drew Brown. Uh, and on the Sonar side, uh, Jenna Santiani, who was with us almost from the beginning of the project, and Tom Lasinski, who runs Sonar. And again, I know you guys took a huge risk on the project and on me, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, another group of people worth thanking, the Texas Film Commission and Governor Rick Perry, who are big fans of the book and, and were, who were actually instrumental in getting the project brought here to Texas. Uh, we filmed the whole show here. It was a the, the entire crew was from Texas, and they knew it was kind of the, their story, and they really gave it their all. So I'm really grateful for, for those guys, too. So uh, a bit about what you're actually going to watch here. In this episode, we're getting introduced to Eli McCullough, who's the main character, uh, both in the, in the show and in the book. We're seeing him at uh, two different points in his life. In one time period, uh, the kind of earlier period, he's a boy or a young man, it's about 1849. He's born on the frontier. He's born into one of those families who lives way, way past the line of settlement. 
He spent the first 10 years of his life living in the Republic of Texas, which has recently become a state. And then we see him later in life. So this other time period of the show, we see Eli in 1915. He's a man in late middle age who's wrestling with a lot of the changes that are happening in his, in his world. Um, but by then, he and his family have a ranch in South Texas, very close to the border. And again, it's 1915, Mexico's in shambles. We're five years into their revolution. There are three different factions fighting for control of the country. And there are a lot of refugees spilling north um, into the US, into Texas, and along with the refugees, a small but sort of meaningful criminal element. This is, um, 915 is, is the beginning of what Anglo-Texans have historically called the Bandit Wars, and uh, what Te Te uh, Tejanos have referred to as either the killing, or the time of killing, or the hour of blood. Um, and l like the book, the show is gonna alternate constantly between these two stages of Eli's life. First, as a young man on the frontier, coming into himself, and then as a mature man, the dawn of the 20th century, the dawn of the modern era, uh, who over the course of the first season and over the course of the show, begins to wonder if these principles that have always guided him through a very violent world, a very violent upbringing and violent adulthood, he, he's beginning to wonder if these principles are still relevant in the 20th century. Eli is torn between the love he feels for his family and the sense that they may not be prepared enough for a violence that is about to come at them. So Eli in 1849 is played by Jake Bloffland, the wonderful actor who you guys may remember from the movie Mud. And Eli in 1915 is played by a little known guy named Pierce Brosnan, <laughs> who is with us here tonight. And will be taking some uh, questions after the showing. So as you guys already know, but we'll certainly be reminded of here, P Pierce is absolutely tremendous. So with that said, I'll get out of here. And uh, thank you guys for coming. I hope you enjoy this. Well, I have the pleasure of welcoming our panel this evening, and we will start with former director of the LBJ Library, Mark Eptegrove. Um, we then have the, Mark? Yep. Okay, well, yeah, we'll clap, Mark. <laughs> the author of this amazing uh, ser series and book that you have just seen, Philip Meyer. Someone, of course, who needs no introduction, Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> and showrunner and producer, Kevin Murphy. Kevin. Well, gentlemen, welcome to the LBJ Presidential Library. I'm and, glad to uh, be here. Thanks. Very much. And congratulations on a stunning accomplishment. It's just magnificent. Uh, and I, I want to start with you, Pierce. Um, A-list actor that you are, uh, with the pick of so many projects, what led you to The Sun? Philip Meyer, his book. When this book came out, I read it, and uh, it was heralded greatly in all the papers, and uh, I wanted to see what it was about, and uh, the book stayed with me. And then last summer, lo and behold, uh, the part of Eli came to me, and my, I was going to go off and do a movie in Russia, and that fell apart, and I said to my agent, look, I don't want to sit around on my backside here, I want to go to work. And he said, well, you've <laughs> just been offered this 10-part uh, 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 part series, AMC, and um, I read the first uh, five scripts, and they were just uh, really well-founded. I loved the part of Eli, and um, so it was the writing, the story, the character, the challenge of playing a man like this. And, um, you know, before I knew it, I was here in Texas. I was uh, up on a horse and playing this man. <laughs> but you had read the book prior to knowing that the, the, yeah, the, the role was available to you. 
Yes, I mean, the, the, the book, uh, I went out and bought it. It's, I live in Malibu, and we did have a, a bookstore then. And I went down, and I, <laughs> I purchased it. And, um, and then, lo and behold, it burnt in a fire in the house. But that's another story altogether. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, it was, uh, I think Eli and, I and myself found each other at the right time uh, there last summer. And uh, I came in at the 11th hour to this production. Mm, there was another man's name on this character, and uh, Sam Neill, but Sam, for one reason or another, couldn't make the commitment, and they, they came to me. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a baptism by fire in many regards. But uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful baptism. Well, they're lucky to have you. Uh, Philip, uh, Philip is an Austinite, but a native of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and came here, studied at the, the Michener School under Jim Magnuson. Uh, I, I wonder, you've written this, what I think will be a classic Texas epic. How does a kid from Baltimore, Maryland uh, write <laughs> an epic Texas novel? Um, yeah, I, I guess I came here in 2005, and di I didn't know much about the state, but I fell in love with the place right away. Uh, within a month, I thought, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to stay here. And uh, I was working on my, my first novel, American Rust, at that time, but I knew, I think I took a Texas history class with Don Graham, and I, I knew that I was going to write about Texas. This is probably 2005 or six. Um, there are two types of, of novelists. There, on, one, on one hand, you have the, the type of, of writer who, as long as the, the story is sort of psychologically real and as long as the, you believe that you're inside the mind of this person, they don't care if they get the facts right, right? And, and that, which is fun. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm the other type. So if I don't understand everything about a world I'm writing about, <clears throat> I, 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 have to, I stop typing. So it, it's, um, this is sort of like OCD quality that has punished me for a lot of my life. Uh, so for this book, I ended up reading about 350 works of nonfiction. I actually stopped reading all books about the West because it's so tough with this story and this mythology to figure out what's true and what's not. You know, even someone like Cormac McCarthy, they're sort of strange <laughs> factual errors and blood meridian and things, which is otherwise a masterpiece. So most of what we know about the West and Texas and the sort of story of the settling of, of this land um, is from fiction, and most of it is, in fact, fiction. So I wanted to write a book that actually was just fact. Um, and, and I think like that's kind of how it came about. In some ways, it was easier being from outside, because no, there was nothing, you know, I wasn't worried about making my grandma mad or cutting me out of the will, you know. Um, <laughs> And I, I presumed for a while that a lot of people would be mad at me, and there, there was sort of this, the, you know, sort of the thought, well, geez, I say sort of true, but uh, unflattering things about some Native Americans, um, about, towards the, about the Comanches are fairly violent toward their enemies. I say true, but occasionally unflattering things about um, Anglos in South Texas, especially in 1915. <laughs> um, but, but I think in the end, the, the book and the show treat everyone so even-handedly, you know, there are no heroes, there are no villains. Everyone comes off as, as, as a real person. Um, so maybe, maybe the people forgive us you know, because of that. Are these characters based on actual people that you, that you discovered when you were reading history? Are they composite characters? Who, who are they and how did, they, how did you conceive them? Yeah, they're composites. I mean, Eli McCullough, the only, the sort of closest thing, is he's sort of a composite of Charles Goodnight uh, and Herman Lehman, you know, his most famous Comanche captive. Um, but, but even in the end, you sort of have to do enough research. You, you learn enough about the world, and then you forget everything, right? Because I, I, I found that when I have too many facts in my head, it actually paralyzes my, my artistic brain or my creative brain, and I sort of stick to the facts, which prevents the characters from, from really, you know, uh, coming alive. In terms of the, the, everything else is a composite. I mean. Uh, the problem with all these powerful Texas families is you have one or two interesting members and everyone else is a drunk or a lush, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they spend their money on helicopters or cocaine or something like this. And, um, not naming names, obviously, but, um, but, but, but the, and this, so th this family that has three very powerful people, they're all very different. Um, that's definitely an invention. It's hard to find, you know, you know even in some of the Kennedys, it's hard to find you know, there's one strong man and maybe a few weaker brothers or something, but um, yeah. Kevin, this is not only 
uh, an ambitious novel and screenplay, but an extraordinarily ambitious production. How do you stage something like this that, that takes you back a hundred years? I mean, it's, it, you, there's a very cinematic quality to this, this miniseries, which has got to be enormously complex. How do you do that? How do you ensure that your, your production is in keeping with the times? Well, uh, having advanced lead time is probably the most important asset that we have. And the way that AMC put this together was uh, I was brought in once uh, uh, Philip and his two partners had written uh, the initial uh, script adaptation. And my job was to help put together a writing <coughs> staff, help arc out what that first season was going to be, pitch it, get it approved by the network, and then put together all the other stuff. For, for those who don't know, what, what I do is I'm a showrunner, which is um, I'm basically the, the, the final uh, like arbiter of responsibility for all of the creative and production decisions, which is you know, your scripts and hiring your directors and your casting and uh, you know, editing music, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so the real, the real problem with the show is we had a good amount of money from our uh, awesome studio at AMC and Sonar um, to make one really good show. But what you have seen tonight is two really good shows because we have a complete set of Comanche cast members and young Eli. We have a complete set of a sizable cast of 1915 cast members. They're all in different locations. They're all shot with a different look. Uh, they use different lenses on the cameras. And it's a really, really difficult um, undertaking. And the only way that we're able to do it in uh, a responsible fashion and have it look as good as what you saw up there is because AMC let us write seven scripts before they picked up the show. Whereas normally like you shoot a pilot, you have one script and then you're like running and you're, uh, you're maybe like your writing is like a week ahead of you know, what you're about to shoot and that's not a, a good way to get anything done. Um, so in this case, I think AMC was very smart about how they, uh, how they asked us to kind of set things up and I think it, you know, hopefully it shows on the screen. It's one, it's one project and two productions. Exactly, yeah. So yeah. we have to make, each dollar has to stretch twice yeah. as far. Yeah. Uh, Pierce, what makes this very complex character, Eli McCullough, tick? Well, the man is born of war, he is born of violence. Uh, he's a man that's fractured, uh, deeply fractured. He's uh, someone who's lost by the time you see him in the story, he's lost three families in his life. He's a man who is, knows that he's born of violence. He knows that uh, he has to control the violence in his own life. Um, but he's a good man at heart. He's a man that's also kind of the head of his time within the family that he has and the surroundings of his life. Uh, and so the ingredients of this man kind of uh, stuck to my bones. Um, I know something about life. I know something about being a father. I came to it from a father's perspective. Uh, as a man who's got sons um, and now grandchildren. So uh, there are many emblems of the man's life that uh, I identified with. Um, but uh, there's also the duality of the character. He's a man that's been uh, brutalized by the Comanches, and he is a Comanche, really. He, he has the essence of, of that breeding in his bones. So, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I got my son's cold, and I'm just getting over it. So, um, yeah, he was, there was, there was, it was a feast of a, of a part to play, and I think when you, when you watch it, uh, and you go through the story in the next 10 episodes, more will be revealed of this man. And it's the ambivalence of playing a character which you're not sure if you like him or, uh, or you agree with his barbarity in life. So all of those ingredients was what kind of made me um, revel in playing the character. He's very much oriented to the future, as you can see <coughs> in this first episode. But is he haunted by the past? Oh, he's completely haunted by his past. And uh, again, as you, as you go deeper into the, into the, the episodes, this is revealed. And um, how could he not be haunted uh, and, and fractured by such a, a you know, savage upbringing? Philip, you have um, a very interesting past yourself, albeit not a haunted one. Uh, but um, you were 
born to be a novelist. And you knew that from an, a very early age. Just talk briefly about what led you to put pen to paper as an author. Sure. I mean, I, I, was, I was a juvenile delinquent. I mean, I was genuine. <laughs> you know, I was kind of a nightmare for my parents. I got arrested the first time in the seventh grade. Um, <laughs> I take it back, it Thank is a haunted you. past. Thank I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I remember my mother coming to the police station. I was however old you are in the seventh grade, 13, 12, and I was ha handcuffed to a radiator. <laughs> Looking at her, and I was like a sweet, innocent boy in her mind, because I, you know, I read a lot of books. You know, I was always a sort of read. I can't really learn to read. Um, and by the time I was 15, I'd stopped going to school and dropped out when I was 16. Um, and, uh, but I was just... I would just devour books, even though I was working as, I was a 16 full-time bike mechanic, basically. Sucking down books, sucking down books, sucking down books, and I started college when I was uh, 21. And something, it was like the, the, fr the freshman composition course, it's like, hey, do this writing assignment, and for some reason, maybe it was the first time I'd been treated like a grown-up by a professor, I don't know, something clicked, and it was like, um, I mean, it, it, the, the closest experience I can say is it's almost like it's sort of hitting puberty a, a second time. There's something that's in you. Um, you can't stop it. You, you, you have to kind of what, ride it out, and you, you're either going to embrace this thing or, or you're going to try, try to, to hide from it. So I spent the next 10 years, I wrote two, two failed novels, um, one in college. It was, it was very long. It was also very, very bad. Like all my, uh, my friends got to about page 10 of 600. Um, I put that one down and said, oh, you're obviously a literary genius, Meyer. Um, so I started writing a second novel. And at this point, I was working at this investment banking job. I got about halfway through it. And I was sure, absolutely certain, that I was some kind of, I was kind of massive literary success with this. So I quit the investment banking job, finished that second novel. Um, it, which was then rejected by about a hundred, by like every literary agent in the country. Uh, I was out of money. I moved back into my parents' basement. It's about 30. <laughs> every your parents' nightmare? Yeah, so, by the way. I mean, hey, what's up, guys? Uh, um, you know, your son's back. So I was back in the old neighborhood and got a job working for my friend's construction company and remodeling houses and driving an ambulance when that didn't pay enough. And, and then, yeah, I went through a couple years. I said, like, well, at least I'll go to graduate school. Applied to like eight or 10 graduate schools. Was rejected by all of them. Um, and I should point out this whole time, I had not published anything. So I had never published. But my data point for thinking I was a good writer came entirely from some crazy thing in my head. I mean, I literally published nothing. So people were like, Meyer, where's your book? It's like, well, it didn't get published. It's like, didn't you leave this job on Wall Street to do this? It's like, why are you living in your parents' basement? So. Um, Eventually, there's a kind of, art, well, there was, you basically, uh, in a very serious way, you start to question artistically everything you're doing. And um, there's a very kind of deep, dark two-year period. And uh, when I came out of it, I, I sort of knew my artistic voice. I knew how art worked, at least in a way that I could grasp. And I had kind of tr crossed over from being an apprentice uh, to at least a kind of a, a tradesman as, as a novelist. Um, and that's when I got into Michener right away. And that was sort of the beginning of this, of this um, uh, path, I guess. And so uh, the fa you know, failure and sort of like staring down the demons and knowing what it, me what it means to you to make art. You know, I've never written for money ever, ever. I've never worked on a project that I didn't, that I wouldn't have done for free. Um, and so I, I mean, I'm obviously incredibly spoiled, um, but I also have, I think I have a very, very high risk tolerance, you know, which I, I mean, I don't have a kids, it makes it a little easier. Uh, my parents are very encouraging, which, which also made it, made it easier. Um, but I think at a young age, I just realized, oh, you know what, my ego means nothing. Failure means nothing. Embarrassment means nothing. Um, that all those things are, 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 you have to pass through them to, to get to the thing that, that, that you want. It's a remarkable story and perseverance. Uh, just a, a note, uh, Philip went from his parents' basement to writing a novel uh, that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. It's a, just a remarkable story of endurance. Thanks, Mom. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mom. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, why does this story matter today, in today's America? Uh, that was one of the things that, you know, that, that brought me to the project was reading the book. Uh, it, it just was transformative. And what I really loved uh, 
in Philip's book and Philip's writing and what we've tried to really tease out and preserve and, and build upon in the show is the exploration of cultural divides. And the real truth is that even though we have kids go into our school rooms and they put their hands on their heart and they pledge that we're one nation indivisible under God, that's not really true. We've always been a nation of very, very stark divisions. And we've been a, we've been a nation of conquer and conquered, of dominator and dominated. And that's just, and that goes all the way back to uh, the Arawaks and, 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 and Columbus meeting for the first time. And it has always been a case where, it, you know, sometimes it's economic, sometimes it's racial, sometimes it's sociocultural, but that has always been there. And it's a big part of who we are. And I think right now, wherever you may happen to be on, you know, the political spectrum, the events of the last couple of years have kind of reminded people how truly divided our country is. And I think that if we can do anything productive in our art and telling our story is looking at this particular moment in time in the, or period in the state of Texas and looking at how all of these different cultures had this unbridgeable chasm between them. And I think that by looking at this as, as we go through our first season of the show, um, we recognize that those divisions that we thought were brand new actually have been here all along. And I think once you acknowledge the elephant in the room, you acknowledge the division, then you can start exploring solutions as to how to build a bridge to bring us together and make us a better and stronger country. And I think that, that's, that for me, that's, that's what makes the book worth adapting and makes the television series worth you know, creating and you know, spending years of our lives e executing. I, I learned backstage that uh that Pierce Brosnan came over uh, from, for, to, the, to the United States from London and started his career in the early 1980s in, in Hollywood and got uh, in his first interview, Remington Steel, which became a very successful okay. series. And it's, uh, I guess it's luck of the Irish, but uh, uh, Pierce, how has your industry changed since you arrived in Hollywood all those years ago? Uh, well, that's a very broad question, and uh, it, 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 it's changed and it, it hasn't really changed. The essence of being an actor and performing as an actor remains the same, but uh, there is so much content now, and there are so many platforms for the content to be seen by the, the, the public at large. Uh, the world of TV has certainly uh, become, you know, has found its golden glory again. It seems, and that's why I wanted to be part of this production. I wanted to, I had been looking actively for a show like this. And um, just because the, the writing is so nuanced and so textured and uh, the quality of players uh, and the, the exploration of characters and stories are so diverse. So in many respects, it has changed from the days of 1981 when I came to America and did Remington Steel and there was just a few channels. Now you have just this glut of, uh, of, uh, of uh, content to choose from. Uh, but the essence of being an actor and performing in TV or performing in a, in a movie is, is, are the same principles. You know, you have the character which you have to study and, and inform yourself about, and then you have a camera and a director. So, um, uh, it's it's somewhat the same, but it's it, it has a greater complexity and more variety. Is this might be a rhetorical question, Pierce? But is this the golden age of television? Has television ever been better than it is today? Oh, I think it's I, I, I think it's magnificent now. I think what you the the choices that people have. I mean, the movies are somewhat diminishing because of TV, um, and because you have uh, you have these tenpole movies which are so enormous that uh, they will start to fill stadiums, but the intimacy of, of drama and a, and a piece like The Sun uh, or any of the shows that you watch um, are to be cherished, I think, in people's homes. And um, yeah, it has changed. Ser serious drama has moved. When we were all kids, serious drama was, you know, there wasn't even a term, it was a serious movie. Mm -hmm. All real drama was on, t was on uh, movies, TV didn't become good till the early 2000s, basically. Um, now, the, that pendulum has swung so far, 
you know, so a movie like Moonlight or something where there's a serious trauma, it's a very good movie. Um, these things were, you know, there were, there were dozens of these movies in the 90s. There were dozens of them in the 80s. Now, if you're lucky, there's one a year because all that storytelling really has moved to DV. The people who would write that stuff, like me, have moved to TV. Actors have, have moved to TV. Everyone who's serious has moved to TV. I mean, the, the reason that this uh, first episode looks so cinematic we had a feature director direct it, a young guy named Tom Harper, he's a brilliant guy. Um, the guy who's the DP, the cinematographer, is another big features guy, right? So you have all these people who, in the 90s, for sure would have ended up working in movies. You know, now they've come to TV. I mean, th this is a radical change in the business. Um, you know, no one, I think, very few novelists in the 90s would have ever thought, oh, I'm gonna work in TV. No, because it was like, what, what are you gonna want, right? I mean. But now everyone I know is another novel. It's like, oh, how do I get my own TV show, man? You know, I mean, um, everyone is thinking about TV, and there's something more compelling, I think, about a 10-hour TV show that you can watch from your house on your 60-inch you know, screen mm -hmm. than there is about a two-hour movie, which a two-hour mo movie now feels like a short story to me, you know, after watching The Wire and all these kind of legendary shows, so. Uh, Kevin, uh Pierce alluded to how the series evolves, but tell, tell us what we can expect as the season progresses and as we get into uh, the next season. Well, as, as the season progresses, um, you start to see that there's a family triangle that forms. And on, you know, at, at one point you've got Jeannie, and then you've got her grandfather, Eli, and you've got her father, Pete, which is, a, for people familiar with the book, uh, we've moved her forward a generation so we could have you show things in television as opposed to get into people's heads in that way. So it allows these characters to really have meaningful scenes together because they're closer together in age. But what you're gonna be seeing is as Eli uh, and the family uh, increase their desperate uh, efforts to make up for the oil rig that was destroyed at the end of this first episode and trying to find oil, Eli does find oil. Uh, and he finds it in an unexpected place, and he finds it with uh, Jeannie uh, being there with him, and it becomes sort of a tug of war between Pete and uh, and Eli, kind of for the heart and soul of uh, of, of this uh, amazing young woman, mm -hmm. who over the course of several seasons, as the other characters, you know, you know, age, uh, she will step into the center, and at some point in the future of the series, she will become the, uh, the lead character. So we're eventually gonna get to all the wonderful places that's in Philip's book, it's just we're not starting at that place. And as we move forward, the 1915 storyline will become the 1919 storyline, will become the 1936 storyline, uh, our 1849 storyline with, with Jacob and young Eli, that will also continue moving forward in time through the Civil War, through the, uh, the, the eventual fall of the Comanche Empire, and then the, the end of the Old West until it catches up with where the series begins. Yeah. Pierce, did, growing up in Ireland, did you, uh, there's a mystique about Texas, that seems. Growing up in Ireland, did you have perceptions of Texas? Did you have any knowledge of, of, of Texas history that might have informed the way you approached this project? Well, I grew up on the banks of the River Boyne in County Meath, and it was a small country town, so there was just two cinemas. There was the palace at one end of the, 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 the town and Lyric at the other, and I, I, was, I, you know, I was brought up on a staple of westerns. The, the western was very much part of my childhood, and it was always playing cowboys and Indians in the fields. I was always an Indian. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I, I lived with my grandmother, and she always brought the... The Crutchies in, there was old Mark Crutchy, and she used to come around every, every springtime with her two sons, and they, were, they knew how to make the best bow and arrows, and how to put the pennies on the railway line, and make the best kind of uh, arrowheads. So that, that, that was very much part of my childhood, and uh, so the, the Western has had a romantic place in my heart, as I think it does in everyone's heart. And uh, I did one other Western before this with Liam Neeson, a movie called Seraph and Falls. Um, but this I don't really consider a Western. It's a, it's a family drama set in 1915, but uh, I do play a man who straps a gun on his hip and uh, has, uh, has blood on his hands and violence in his, in his, in his psyche. 
Um, but the Western has always been, I've always been attracted by it. And uh, I ride horses, I love horses. And uh, so it was really, for me, the challenge was getting my, 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 my tongue around the Texan accent. And um, <laughs> so uh, I, I kind of jumped in with both feet. And because I came into this project at the 11th hour, I didn't really have time for wiggle room or doubting myself. I just had to go for it. And I uh, had a wonderful dialect coach who, who um, you know, we, we listened to Waylon Jennings, Jennings Willie Nelson, <laughs> Rick Perry, Senator Poe, and various other, uh, very, Pope, various other people. And uh, somehow I picked the bones out of it all. And uh, that's the voice that you hear tonight. Philip, it's, uh, you conceived this novel in your head, and then you had the challenge of writing the screenplay to put it on film. Talk about that challenge, the, the, the challenge of taking a novel and making it into a film, or a miniseries in mm, this case. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, so, so just a point of clarification, it was originally going to become a miniseries, and then the AMC made us it made it, make it into an ongoing series. So that's how we, yeah, they, they twisted our arm. So in theory, there'll be a season two, and it'll, it'll continue on. Um, but originally, that is what we, we, we sold, was a miniseries. So um, the screenplays are funny, because the, the biggest difference is that you realize um, you're not making art when you write a screenplay. You're making a blueprint for other people to make art. And, and I had sensed this the whole time. Um, we're developing the project and stuff. And it wasn't until the first or second day of shooting, uh, Pierce and um, uh, Sidney Lucas, who in the scene you guys saw with the, sort of the hanged man and the wildflowers, um, uh, which have written this. And I thought, okay, this is quite good. Um, this will play pretty well. And then I saw these guys do it, and it, there was something like quite magical. And I realized, oh, okay, the words don't, they're important, but the art is happening here. The art happens in front of the camera. You know, no one goes and reads old screenplays. You go and you read old poems or novels, you go see a, you know, no one goes and reads a, you don't go see a blueprint of a, of a cathedral, you go see the, the, the cathedral itself. And that is what a screenplay is, um, and realizing that, yeah, sure, you're an artist, but not really, like, you're like the coach and support staff for these guys, and of course, you know, the role is quite important, but it's not the same as being a, a, a novelist. It really is learning, okay, what, what do the actors need? You know, Pierce would text me about some line that he disagreed with, and I would say, oh, look, I'm, I'm browsing, blah, 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 don't, don't mess with these scripts, um, and he's like, all right, Meyer, I'll do it. And then I, I would look at the tapes for that day, and he would do it. And I would look at the tapes and be like, "Oh, crap! He was he was right." <laughs> you know? and, uh, and of course, I should have I should have listened to him because of course of course he knew. You know, he's like, "This these there's too many syllables in this sentence. I can't get it all out." You know, um, so that's the biggest difference is you're you're sort of um, you're sort of a coach and support staff rather than being the kind of you know the, the guy who's actually playing. I mean, and um, and it. it in some ways, it's it, it's nice. Yeah, you, know? you kind of write it, sit back, and this guy has to do the hard work. You know? uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but in terms of adapting, I mean, you know, you we had so many versions of this because originally it was a miniseries. So the the, guy, the other creators and I who also went to the Mission Center, uh, they also went to UT here. Yeah, we, we, we saw this as an eight-hour miniseries for a long time, and then AMC said they wanted something longer, so then we saw it as a five-hour, uh, sort of five-season arc, so we spent, over the course of these three years we're developing, and we broke down five seasons of stuff. Um, and once you divorce yourself from the idea of, like, being faithful to the novel in terms of incident, and you say, well, be faithful in terms of the types of people, the types of characters, the philosophy that you're getting at, um, uh, the, the sort of tone or sense of the world, but in terms of the things that happen in the book, they, 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 they don't have to happen uh, in the show. And in fact, uh, you know, a lot parts of the show are, are prequels to the book, parts of the show are, don't happen in the book uh, at all, and I think this is, this is all for the better. Well, what you've made collectively is indeed art. Uh, we uh, give you hearty congratulations on the project. We look forward to seeing it as it rolls out, and we thank you very much for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.